All right, repeat after, well, finish this phrase. If we don't learn from the past, we're destined to repeat it, repeat it. And I don't know if you're like me or not, but sometimes there are lessons in life that are, that are hard to learn. And I don't know if you've ever found yourself just like kind of repeating the same thing over and over and over, and you're like, well, how, why am I still doing this again? Is that loud? There we go. Okay. Um, it, 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 and life can be like that. It's like the movie um, Groundhog's Day. Has anybody seen Groundhog's Day with Bill Murray? Okay, if you haven't, it's like 30 years old, so you, you, you should see it. If I ruin it for you, that, that's on you, right? Uh, but in the movie Groundhog Day, Bill Murray is kind of a jerk, uh, and he repeats the same day over and over and over again. And one of the big themes of the movie is that he has to learn uh, uh, how to be different, right? He has to learn about why, you know, what's making him a jerk and how to be nicer. And it isn't until he learns some lessons that his day can move, move forward. Um, it's, it's a fun movie, if you've never seen it, but, uh, but life can be like that. And, and I know how that's like, and I, we probably all have experienced that at, at some level. And as we, as we dive into scripture, it's supposed to help us learn lessons about how to live our lives better, how to, how to be conformed to the image of Christ as, we become his, as we're his disciples through, through a course of a lifetime. And so today we're starting a, a journey, a journey through seven ancient churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, it'll be a, a fun journey for us, I, I think, that will help us see the lessons that these seven churches were supposed to learn, but at the same time, help us learn lessons as well for, for our own lives. How do we become better and keep moving forward, both looking at our own lives and our own past to say, what can I change and how can I be different? But also, what's God teaching us through these ancient lessons, these ancient churches, uh, and how we should live? What does it mean to, to really be a Christian um, in today's world, because this, this book that we study, God's word is different. It's different than any other book that exists. It's alive and it's active. And, and as we read it, as we meditate on it, as we let it sink into our hearts and our minds, it changes us. It changes us. And it's relevant for our lives today, even though we're reading ancient literature. And what we'll see through the course of the next few weeks is we'll see really specific things, and we'll look at pictures, and we'll go on this journey together to, to see what that, those churches would have understood and experienced, these lessons are still for us today. And, and the goal is for us to learn from the past so that we can live lives better today and as we move into the future. Because really the goal of discipleship, being a disciple of Jesus, is to follow our master, to be more like Christ over the course of our life. And as we do we learn to love him more, we learn to love others more, and, and we change. And we become lights in this, in this really dark, this dark world. Um, and, and so hopefully, I'm hoping that through this series, um, or through this journey that we're gonna go on, we'll all fall in love with Jesus more, grow a little bit more, and we'll, we'll let the word of God really impact our lives and our souls. So as we begin, again, this isn't a series on the book of Revelation, but we're gonna be in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's, it's Revelation with no S at the end, just as a little Bible tip. Uh, but let's start here by reading verses 1, 4 through 11 together, um, just as an introduction to the, to the book. Today, I want to just kick off kind of where we're going uh, and, and, and lead us kind of into the, the journey through these, these seven churches. So this is chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. It says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia... Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. 
I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So, the book of Revelation, right? And even as we read the intro, you're like, there's a lot there, right? Uh, if you've ever read through the entire book of Revelation, it's, it's confusing, right? It's, it's considered what's called apocalyptic literature, which means it's highly, there's a lot of figurative language, there's a lot of specific details that are, that are specific to the time and places, but it's also drenched in the Old Testament. John is assuming his readers are, are Old Testament scholars, that you just can make these connections as you're reading through it. And, and depending on where you grew up going to church or what tradition you're in, or if you, your, your end times theology, or if you read the Left Behind series in your life, right? You're going you're gonna to view the book of Revelation in, in different ways. There's, there's different ways that people understand it. And for some, it actually stresses people out, the book of Revelation. It's the last book in our New Testament. And for some, um, they, they see it like this, like, like an apocalypse. Uh, if you ever see those apocalyptic movies, like a zombie apocalypse or... Uh, they'll read the book of Revelation, or they'll think about it, and they'll think, man, it's just going to be, it sounds disastrous. It sounds, it sounds hard. I, I, we have a, an aunt, my wife's aunt, Mary, uh, and she calls herself an end-time prepper, which is another word for hoarder, but, but we love her. Uh, and she's really seeing the things that she's collected as something that will be helpful during a time maybe like this sometime in the, in the future. Um, but but the book of Revelation isn't supposed to, to scare us. It's not supposed to be something that we read and we stress out and worry about. As believers, it's supposed to be something that, we, that gives us hope. Because at the end of Revelation, Jesus comes back. And so it's, it's like this. This is, my, this is an AI rendering of Jesus' return. I typed into ChatGPT, give me a picture of Jesus' return. And this is what it, it got. Uh, so it's not supposed to be scary, for Christians, it's supposed to be um, something you read and you think, man, no matter how bad the world gets, no matter how bad, much it seems to be out of control, and I know we see it, I see it in our lives, in the world, um, there's an end. There's, there, there's an end. It, it will culminate in the, in the return of Jesus. He'll renew heaven and earth together. For believers, we'll spend eternity in a, in a new existence without pain and sorrow. And it's, it's, it's something that gives us hope for the future. Revelation isn't something that should scare us, but that should give us hope that there's an end in sight. And whether we, we see that end when Jesus comes or we see it in our, in our own lives, all of us as believers have, have hope for eternity. That death isn't something that we, can, we, we need to be scared of. It's something that just leads us into a new reality of, of, of heaven, to be, to be with Jesus, with God for all eternity, in a, in, a, in a way that's different than this world that can be dark and, and disastrous a lot of times. So in, this, in, in chapters 2 and 3, uh, John writes specifically to these, these seven churches. Uh, and what we're going to explore as we move through the next few weeks is these specific little, little messages, what it meant for them, and what, what, they, what those messages mean for us today. So it'll be, a, it'll be a fun journey. But we have the author is John, and so as, to kick off really this, this, this uh, series through these seven churches, I want us first to consider John as a, as a case study for what it means for us to grow over the course of our lifetime. Because what we're going to learn here in this next, in the, again, the next few weeks is, is lessons from the past that should help us change our lives as we move forward, that should speak to us in our hearts and our souls and help us become better and different people. And so John is a good case study for us to learn because this would happen to him over the course of, of his life. So think about it with me for a second. John, uh, was one of Jesus' 12 apostles, and he was called with his brother James as fishermen, and Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder. 
Now, why would you be nicknamed a son of thunder? What are some reasons? Loud. You're loud. Yeah, thanks, Paul. You can, you're loud. What else? Unpredictable. You're unpredictable. Thanks, Dan. What else? Aggressive. You're aggressive. You're what? Gets your yeah, gets your attention. Right, you're, you're maybe impetuous, maybe you use colorful language. I don't know if you've ever think in your mind, yeah, if you're thinking of somebody in your mind, don't look at them, like just look at me, right? But some, this could remind you of somebody that you know or somebody in your family, but there's a reason Jesus names them the, the sons of thunder. It's these different things that, yeah, I can kind of see what that means in, in my mind. This, is, this was John when Jesus calls him into his ministry. And this is John, even a few weeks ago, if you remember, after the transfiguration, um, uh, John and his brother come to Jesus, and they say, hey, when you're in your glory, can we be at your right and your left side? So even at that point in the ministry, he's still seeking power. There's something about who he is that's, that's not quite aligned yet with the ministry of, of Jesus. But then, but then something changes in John. It's like a, something, a flip gets switched or he, he starts to understand who Jesus is and what really, what it means to live life under knowing who Jesus is. Because at the crucifixion, he's the only one of the 12 that's there. So something changes, something happens, and for some reason he's there uh, w- without any other of the 12. Um, there's Mary's there and Martha and, and some other disciples, but he's the only one of the 12. And Jesus has an intimate moment with him while he puts his mom in his care. And from that moment on, John's life is different. He, he grows and it, he changes. And, and as the church starts growing, he becomes a leader in the, in the early church. Uh, and he ends up living longer than all the other apostles. Uh, and, and what he experiences, even here in the book of Revelation, he gets a glimpse of the future, something unique, something about John is, is different. And what we see in John is is kind of fascinating because when you look at the four Gospels, you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are called the synoptic Gospels because they're similar. They're very similar in style and in structure, but John is different. And one of the main reasons John is different is because he doesn't have a birth narrative. Remember, he starts with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he has this deep theological reflection on the Trinity. So he starts his gospel with a deep theological uh, like the, a reflection of the Trinity and how the second person of the Trinity takes on humanity to live a life that we can't live to die for us so that we can have new life here and into eternity. It's different. And in this deep theological reflection, as he's continuing to think about this in his life, he ends up writing these three letters that we have later in, in the New Testament. And in 1 John, do you know where this deep theological reflection takes him to talk most about? About love. He talks more about love and remaining in Christ in 1 John than any other book in the New Testament. And the lesson from John is this. The more we think about who God is, the more we learn about him through his word, the more we let sink into our minds who Jesus is and what he really did for us, the more we love him. And the more we love him, the more we change. And the more we change, the more we love others. And so we see John and his life going from this son of thunder to the apostle that Jesus loved to this guy who is writing um, his letters about loving and remaining in Christ, staying connected as close as we can in this this difficult world so that we can grow and become different. To not continuously repeat the things of the past, but to, to move forward and to be lights in the world. That's, that's who John is. And so John, in this, he, in this kind of reflection of his life, gets an opportunity to live longer and gets an opportunity to, to see a glimpse of, of the future. And so today and through the next few weeks, we get to hear from him, again, as he's teaching these seven churches some lessons about things that they need to learn to, to change and to grow with, uh, that... that are for us today as well. And we get to help us to sink in to really think about what how we can learn and grow and and be like be like John. So we want to be like John during this during the series. Well we saw that John he's he's exiled on an island called Patmos. 
And you can see it's just off the coast of Asia Minor. Can you, hopefully you can see it. Uh, and it's just off, uh, it's 30 miles from Miletus and 60 miles from Ephesus. Uh, and that's where he's exiled. And he's exiled because of, of his faith in Jesus. He's an old man at this time. Uh, and he's, he's, he can't go back to the mainland. And that, now a lot of us think, when we think of him being exiled, uh, that he's alone on a desert island. It's like Castaway. Have you seen Castaway with Tom Hanks? Maybe, maybe some of you, if you haven't, that's probably 30 years old too. So <laughs> not to ruin it, but he's cast away on an island, right? Uh, and if you watch it, Tom Hanks is by himself. You know, imagine John maybe talking to a volleyball or whatever ball they have at the time. Uh, and he's by himself. But that's not quite what Patmos was. Patmos actually had a military base on it at the time. It had a temple. There were other people there. Exile at the time meant you just can't come back. Like you're, gonna, you're, you're here until it's over, and there's a lot of shame in that, at least socially. So he's stuck here. This is actually Patmos today. It's bustling, as you can see. It's like a little Las Palmas community uh, right off the coast of Asia Minor, which is modern day, modern day Turkey. So this is, where, this is where John was. And while he's exiled there, again, from a social perspective, it's something shameful. But in reality, it's because of his faith in Jesus. And so for him, it's something that he's going to endure and go through because of his faith in Jesus. And during that time of, of exile, he gets this vision which is the last book of our New Testament, which gives us hope for eternity and lets us know, again, that as bad as the world can get, as hard as life can be, as crazy as things seem, there's an end. There's an end when Christ comes back and he redeems the world and, and we get to spend eternity in a new heaven and a new earth. And so John gets this vision and he's going to write to the seven churches uh, that are in this Asia Minor area. Now, there's more cities and there's more churches in this area, uh, but these are the seven that he's specifically targeting uh, and writing these, these letters to in this, in this section. So in 1.4, he says, to the seven churches that are in Asia, and in 1.10, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so over the course, again, of this next few weeks, this journey, we're gonna, each week we're going to look at each of these little messages and say, what would they have understood and experienced? What did the imagery mean? We're going to look at pictures and kind of go on this kind of historical journey. But again, at the end of the day, it's not just to learn more, it's to grow. Right? When we, 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 we learn scripture so that we can change and, and grow ourselves. And the lessons that they were to learn are, are for us today. Because some things never change in the world. There's nothing really new under the sun. We just kind of package things in different, in different ways and in different forms. And there's seven. So the, the number seven, even though, again, there's more churches and more cities, he targets seven. Uh, and in the book of Revelation, and in all of Scripture, the number seven is a number of completeness. So part of this idea that God is giving to John and that he's writing down is really a message not just for these seven churches, but for the church in all times. Because again, what we'll see is that the, even though they're facing individual issues, uh, these issues are very common even for us in the world today. Because again, things, things tend to stay the same. So some of these things that they were facing was persecution, and we'll see this. So they can be, some of these cities, even though they were very close geographically, uh, and some Christians were being killed and imprisoned, and some they were flourishing, just maybe 10 miles away in a different city. But for the ones that are being persecuted, they're being persecuted by the cities, by the government, or even by other religions. And so this is something maybe in America we're not as familiar with or used to, at least not now. Uh, but in other countries around the world, Christians die for their faith. It's illegal to be a Christian. You could be persecuted, imprisoned, or even killed uh, for, for being a Christian even today in, in the world. So persecution is, a, is still a real issue that, that we face. Um, the second is compromise. This might be one that we're more familiar with compromising our faith in Jesus uh, for friends, 
for careers, for, you know, you, you name it, fill in the blank. What, what do you compromise your Christianity for? And so we'll see in these churches, they are experiencing issues of compromise too. And again, it's packaged different depending on the society or the culture, but sometimes we tend to compromise our faith for the benefit of things that we can maybe gain in this world and things like that. So compromise. The third one is false teaching. So just like today, you could have people coming into the church, maybe, you know, teaching things that are bad, theology leading people astray. Uh, you can maybe think in your minds of, of people that have done that, cult leaders or even certain TV stations or, or people that are just help, you know, they, they're not preaching Christ and helping people grow and learn in this world. They're just leading people off into to their past. For false teaching is, is certainly still a thing today. And so for, for us as, as believers, it's important for us to understand God's word, to be in it daily, to, to meditate, to reflect on it. Because when you hear something that is, is wrong, you should, you sh- your ears should perk up. The alarm bell should, should go off and you say, no, that's, I don't think that's right. So we'll see in these letters that, that we have false teachers then and, and even now. And then lovelessness, lovelessness. So some of these churches, um, they forgot how to love. They got so wrapped up in their own little holy huddles or they're like worried so much about what they look like or or did that they forgot that they were supposed to love the world. They're supposed to love people and be lights in the world. Does does any of these things, do any of these things sound familiar? So again, it's it's the same issues that that they had then that we, we can still face today. And again, if we don't learn the lessons from the past, we're going to be bound to repeat them as we, as we move forward in life. So we want, to, we want to learn these lessons, and we will. We're going to dive and, and take a journey through these churches and, and see what they were supposed to learn and understand their culture, and then say, hey, what does that mean for us today in our, in our lives? Where each one of these seven messages are like little mini sermons. Some people say that they're more like letters, but even ancient letters had had a little structure to them. Have any of you ever written a letter? I know letter writing is, how many of you write letters still? Maybe some people, you know, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a rarity now to write a letter, but we type emails, right? And we still have like, a, like, hey, this is Justin. Here's a message, a greeting, a body, you know, uh, sincerely or thank you or, or something. There's a, there's, and there was back then too a structure to letters. Well, these seven little messages don't have a structure of a letter. They have their own structure. And here are the things that are in this structure of these seven messages. There's a Christ title at the beginning of all of them. So the Christ title is pulled from chapter one. and It's given individually to each church, and it's a reflection of something specific about that church that we'll see as we we walk through them. Uh, And and, and the the purpose of that is to focus on, on Christ, the, the number one goal of all of our lives and of these churches and these messages is to, is to primarily be focused on Jesus. Our lives are about Jesus, and our goal of our lives is to grow closer to him as his disciple and become more like him in our lives. And so each one of these starts by focusing the, the readers and the church on who Jesus is and what that means for us. The second is a commendation. Hey, this is what you're doing great. Good job. Good job, Charles. Here's something that you're doing really well in. Keep going with, keep doing that. And then the next thing in each of them is a, a, a complaint. Okay, so here's something that you could do better at. So Aaron, here's something that you could improve on. This is actually also a really good feedback, um, a way to give feedback because it's, hey, here's something you did good. Here's one thing you can do better at, but then here's a correction. Here's how, right? So it's, you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but somebody giving you feedback, but not telling you how to fix it. If you're married, you may have experienced that (laughs) before, Uh, but it's like, okay, yeah, well, tell me what to do. How do I do this differently? Uh, But in this, in these letters, we get a a complaint and then, okay, here's what you need to do to change. But then here's even a consequence, um, a negative and a positive. So if you don't change, here's what will happen. And if you do change, here's a positive outcome. So it's a very good feedback. Just even learning that through these, through these messages is, is very helpful. 
Um, but we'll, and then, then we're going to learn about a contemporary significance. What do, what do we do with these things? Because again, we don't learn just to know this information in Scripture. We learn it to grow. The, the more we know of Scripture, the more we should grow. The more we should change. The more we should think, am I being like John in my life? And am I different now than I was, than I was before? Is there significance? And so as you all read weekly, every week if I send out an email and I say, here's what we're going to read for next week. If you're not getting those emails, let me know, because I want to make sure you, you get them. Okay, let me, let me know that if you're not getting them. Uh, you, you'll get the passage for next week. And as you read, think about the structure, uh, because in some, some of the structure is missing. And where it's missing, it's significant. And so we'll see how that works as we move through these, these seven churches. So not only do they have a, an internal structure like this, there's also a, a literary structure to all seven of them um, together. And this is called a, a chiasm structure. It's an ancient way of organizing something. And so what you see in these seven is that the Smyrna and Philadelphia, which is the second and sixth one, do you see how they're green? It's not meant just to be for like Christmas. Uh, the green means they're positive. So their messages to those two churches are, are more positive than negative. They're doing really good, uh, and that's highlighted in those two. Now, the rest are red. Any idea what red means? Bad. Do you ever used to get papers back in school, and it was like red? I think they did away with that because, like, the, the mental anxiety people had around the color red became bad, right? But, but here, the rest of the churches, the other five, um, are, are more negative than positive, all right, and so there's a lot of things for them to learn and, and understand and grow. And so this is a reflection of, of reality of life, right? For some of us, there's things that we're, we're doing well. There's things that we need to work on. And there's things that the things that we need to work on, we need to make sure we're not repeating so we don't see, you know, we don't have Groundhog Day in our life and, and repeat the same thing over and, and over again. And so we'll walk through these. The, the, the Thyatira, which is the middle one, there's something special about that one that we'll see. It's the middle of the, of the structure, uh, so it's a little different, and it stands out, um, which is really cool. So as we kind of wrap up today and just the introduction to this journey we're going to go on through these, through these seven churches, uh, there's three points in your bulletin I want to I highlight to, for us to think about. The first, again, that it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. You know, we can do whatever study we want to in Scripture. We can go deep. We can, we can you know, go talk about everything. Um, but, but if it's not pointing us in the direction of Jesus, if it's not helping us grow in his likeness, if it's not helping us really reflect on who he is and grow in him, then, then we're missing the point. We don't just learn Scripture as an academic exercise, but as something that really impacts who we are, our lives, and and. and goes deep into our souls. He's the focus. He's the focus of our life and our eternity. The book of Revelation is about hope for the future while learning to live in the present, all focused around the person of Jesus, what he's done for you and what he's going to do in the future. He's given us a new life and he's rescued us from this dark world and we can live differently. And because we have the spirit in us, and we can grow, we don't have to repeat the same things over and over and over again. We have the ability to put off who we were and to put on who we, who we can be. This is our second point. Discipleship is a lifelong process. And, and in John's our example. As we talked about John, you know, going from a, a, a son of thunder to the, uh, to the beloved apostle, to a guy in his old age saying, hey, you know what life's about? It's about love. It's about remaining in, in Christ. So, so just do that. Just do that. And even if you're exiled on Patmos and there's, there's cultural shame there, um, you can be at peace. And not only at peace, but you can be close, closer to Christ and you can have a vision of eternity and, and be able to share for us thousands of years later a sense of peace for the future, knowing that no matter how bad the world gets or how bad it seems spiraling out of control, there's an end, and there's, and there's hope. So John's a good example to us about this. As we, as we put off our old selves, we put on our new selves in Christ. Again, as we focus on him, it's a lifelong process to just be more and more like Christ. And then finally, we must learn from the past. 
We study scripture to learn what God wants for us in our lives today. And we gain li- wisdom to live life well. And even though we're going to look at these seven ancient churches with very ancient things that are happening, and again, it'll be fun. We're going to look at pictures, and we're going to go on a journey together. It'll be a great time to invite people in to, to kind of go on this journey with us. Um, the, the lessons that they learned, the issues they were facing, the things that they should be working on are, are, are very relevant for, uh, for us today. And we can learn from them great lessons for our lives today. And as we do that, we can think about our own individual lives and what are things that we are continuing to work on, to improve on, and to, to be better at as well. The series is meant to help us experience not only these ancient churches, but more importantly to... <clears throat> to say, how am I growing and learning? How is this seeping into my heart? How is this impacting my life and my soul? It's, it's fun to learn. I'm a, I'm a learner, right? It's fun to learn these things and see, oh my gosh, like that's awesome to see the ancient church and, and these things that they were thinking about. But if it stops there, it's, 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 it's not worth it. It's got, it's, got to, it's got to reach inside. Again, scripture is live and active. And it, it reaches in and it cuts us in our, in our soul and our spirits. And it, it should change us and help us be something different. So this is going to be a fun journey for us over the next few weeks. Every week we'll look at a different little sermon. Uh, and we'll, we'll dive into it. And we'll say, what does this mean for us in our lives today? And, and hopefully at the end we'll all, we'll all grow together. And in some ways in our lives we'll, we'll put off some old things that we won't have to repeat in the future. Let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word that although this is ancient literature, it's timeless and it speaks to us even today. Help us as we go through this journey through these ancient churches that not only do we learn some things that are that are neat and exciting, but at the same time, we we really consider what it means for us in our lives. I just pray that we all learn and grow, that we become more like Christ that we, we look at John as our example, and we say, man, wherever I am right now in life, how do I just become more like Jesus over the next few weeks? We love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.